Good afternoon. I am glad you're able to take a moment to devote to worship. One brief announcement before we get started. This coming Sunday afternoon, the 23rd, the day before school starts in South Shelby on the 24th, on the 23rd, we will have a blessing of the new school, South Shelby Elementary. This will be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, rain or shine, we will be out, outdoors, and because we're outdoors, uh, just socially distant, so don't worry about masks, just don't lick each other or anything, and it'll be just fine. Uh, all the churches of Clarence and Shelbina are invited, and I'm talking with pastors so that we bless each part of the life of the school, and I look forward to, look forward to being able to gather with you for that event. The reading for this day comes from the book of Ezra, the fourth chapter. We read, When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the family and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we've been sacrificing to him ever since the days of King Azarhaddon of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the families in Israel said to them, You shall have no part with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus of Persia has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build, and they bribed officials to frustrate their plans throughout the king, reign of King Cyrus of Persia until the reign of King Darius of Persia. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This week we continue with the story of Ezra, this book uh, that tells the story of the Jewish people as they are coming out of exile and rebuilding the temple and then eventually the, rebuilding the city wall. What they're doing is rebuilding themselves as a kingdom, as a nation, as a people devoted to following uh, God faithfully, to be living uh, the calling of God's chosen people. Last week we heard how this began and how they numbered themselves and counted everyone and they came together and they started rebuilding the heart of their kingdom. They started rebuilding the temple, the place where they gathered to worship. They had been sent there by the first emperor of the Persian Empire, uh, Cyrus, and they had begun and they had laid the cornerstone of the temple. Then it gets interesting. An entire situation unfolds that, that involves the local politics of the Persian Empire and of the surrounding kingdoms. The people who are in the surrounding lands, they complain to the next emperor, the next king of the Persian Empire after uh, Cyrus. So Cyrus is the first king, and the next one is a fellow named Artaxerxes. And so the, the, the neighbors, the, Jewish, the neighbors to the Jewish people, they complain to Artaxerxes and they say, if you look up the history of these people, you're going to find they have been rabble-rousers. They have been troublemakers. They have been local powers. And if you let them build this kingdom back up, they're going to cause you trouble. We have the text of this letter. All the letters I'm going to tell you about today, we have the text of them in Ezra 4, 5, and 6, if you want to read along and see how this unfolds. And so the new emperor looks into the history of the Jewish people and finds out that this is the case, that the, uh, Judah had been a strong kingdom and uh, that. And so he says, no, you cannot rebuild this, this temple. It is when the next emperor comes to power, uh, the next one after Artaxerxes is Darius. So the first emperor is Cyrus, who tells the Jewish people to go and rebuild their temple and you're free. And then Artaxerxes, who says, no, stop it. The, your, your neighbors are complaining. If, and then the, the next uh, emperor, the next king, was Darius. And, and the Jewish people, they, they're the ones who send the letter this time. And they say, if you go back and check... Your predecessor a few back, Cyrus, said that we're supposed to build this temple, so uh, can we build this temple now? And Darius goes back and says, oh, 
they got it right, and that's what's in the notes, right? And so they, he commits the resources of the Persian Empire to fund the building of this, this temple. It is interesting to read these letters to see things like the Jewish people. Uh, when, when they write the letter to Darius, they, they, address, they describe God as uh, the God of the heavens, which is a Persian turn of phrase, so they're kind of working their angles. And they're very honest about uh, their situation. They say, you know, we, we fell. Like, we were not faithful, and so we were punished. We were sent into exile, and then your, your predecessor, Cyrus, sent us back home. And so they're very clear about the fact that they had fallen short. And, and it might be that this is a, a case of sort of hardball politics, like this is, is the, the local, uh, the neighbors send a letter in to, to, to complain about something and, and that's it, they're stuck for a while and then as soon as the next uh, king shows up, the Jewish people have learned their lesson about how this works, they're, they're the first ones to get a letter in to, to state their case. And, and it smacks of the, of the way that sometimes that uh, as cases come to the Supreme Court, that uh, they'll, they'll be, as soon as there's a new judge on the court, we'll, we'll, they'll be ponderings about, well, what cases, what new issues, what issue, old issues will come up again in this new situation. So it's like a, a real politic type of thing. And um, this is one of those moments in the Old Testament where I'm not quite sure what to make of this because uh, God had been involved in the, in the leading of Cyrus to let the people be, be freed and go home. And then the other kings, the emperors who follow, don't follow the same track. And, and how is God involved in this? And I, I don't know how to understand that. Uh, reading the Old Testament always has this very wide scope to it. A lot of it happens in the relationship between kingdoms and empires and it, it's hard to tease out how to understand that. What is a bit less challenging to understand is what starts this entire kerfluffle uh, when the Jewish people are approached by their neighbors who ask, can we help uh, rebuild this? They say, let us build with you for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of King Asar Hadan of Is Assyria who brought us here. Now, we might expect that the Jewish people who are facing a monumental task, building a temple, rebuilding a temple that is so big that it took 17 months to get the supplies together and get all the workers lined up, that we might expect them to say, we'll take all the help we can get. Come on over. Right? The concerns... And they say no. And the concerns of the Jewish people turn out to be well-founded, for after they say no, uh, that's when their, their neighbors start complaining and causing problems for them. And so that this kicks off the political intrigue I just described. And so what is going on here? Why, why is this such a contentious issue? The first clue to understanding this is rooted in what the people say, right? Listening to what they say. They say that we have been worshiping this way, worshiping your God, right? Since the days of King Asar Hadan of Assyria. Right? They're marking time counting Assyrian leaders. Okay, what's that mean? If we look back at the history, this, this is all is very deeply rooted in the story of the Jewish people, right? Back in, in, in 931, the 12 tribes of Israel that had formed the nation of Israel split into the 10 tribes that formed the northern Israel and the two tribes that formed the, the southern Judah. And the southern Judah had Jerusalem and had the temple and had the line of David, right? And so they remained faithful to this. And the northern ten tribes, their first king is a dude named Jeroboam. And Jeroboam does not want his people going down to that other kingdom, going down to Judah, going down to worship at the temple at Jerusalem. And so Jeroboam makes two golden calves and sets them at opposite sides of his kingdom and says, these are your gods, the ten tribes of Israel. Here, are, here is what you are going to worship. Here is what brought you out of Egypt. Here are the God, here's your gods, right? Here's your God. 
and it does not go well. All of these ten tribes, right, instead of remaining faithful to worshiping at the temple, faithful to the Torah, faithful to the line of David, faithful to uh, the Ten Commandments, faithful to being God's chosen people, the ten northern tribes, they fade into, uh, they lapse, they, they fall away from this. And so in 721, the northern kingdom of Israel falls to Assyria. In 721, and in the years following this, Assyria does what it did with the places it conquered. It sent its retired soldiers in, and who marry all the daughters of the land, and it makes a new people. And so all these Jewish people of the ten tribes, uh, of the northern ten tribes, go from being, uh, they're, they're defeated, they're conquered by Assyria, as the faith, people who had faded away from being uh, faithful to, to God, and they become the Samaritans, once they have interbred, intermixed with all the Assyrians. And so that's where we get the term Samaritan. And, and so uh, they end up being a people who will worship just whoever. They'll worship the two golden calves. They worship the gods of Assyria. They worship eh, whatever. Like they're, they become very flexible. And so when they tell, uh, and so what happens then is that the, the southern two tribes, the kingdom of Judah, they're plugging along, plugging along, plugging along. And then in 586, they fall and they are deported. Babylon takes all the people off the land and takes them into exile. And so all the people, all these Samaritans of north, the northern ten tribes, they look south and they say, ah, open farmland. And so they start moving south. Open farmland. You got to farm it. Hey, got all these sons. Got to do something with them. Send them south and start some new farms. Build, sort of expand. And so then uh, in fi um, 530, when the people come out of exile, the two, the two uh, tribes that make up the southern kingdom of Judah, they've, gone into, they've been deported by Babylon, and then they are sent back after Babylon falls to Persia, and they are sent back to rebuild the temple, this is a problem for all the people who are expanding south because all the, the Samaritans of the north have been looking south and saying, ah, oh, that's where we're going to expand, and we're expanding there. And all of a sudden, they're back? Wait a minute! That's where we were going to continue to expand. And so they show up and they offer to help, right? Because we know how to worship. We've been worshiping like this all along. Like, that's how, that's how we've worshipped ever since the Syrians took us over. And uh, the Jewish people have returned from exile. They've, they've learned their lesson, right? They had gone into exile because they not, had not been faithful and committed and, and, and committed to following Torah and being God's chosen people. And so they see that this help that is being offered, and they know that the help that is being offered is what had gotten the Assyrians or had gotten the, the northern ten tribes in trouble in the first place, which had led to their fall, their sort of oh, their flexibility in worship, so to speak. And, and so the people who have come back from exile, they're trying to reestablish themselves as a committed and faithful people, following God's teachings, being faithful to God in worship, and, and here come the Samaritans, and they're offering to help, and really what they're wanting is the farmland. And so... Um, that's why they start raising this fuss. They're raising this fuss to try to get all these people who come back from exile kicked out because they want the farmland. Now, it is not that the Jewish people are going to be perfect. They are going to struggle with following through on their commitment. We will hear about that in the coming weeks as they struggle to like finish. They start building the temple, and they have our time finishing building the temple. But what they have done is they are recommitting themselves to the full width and depth of God's claim on their lives. Right? God's claim on them, they understand. They understand fresh and newly experience this. They, they understand that God's claim on them was wide, covering the full width of their lives, from their fishing to their cooking, from their calendar to their family lives. And also, God's claim well, it was what, more than that. God's claim was wide enough to embrace everyone from the highest king to the lowest servant, from the eldest to the newest born. Right? So they understand that God's claim on them was wide, and they understand further that God's claim on them is deep. Deep enough to grapple with their most stubborn sins, to love them even through exile, and to transform the very nature of who they are. 
And, and so they understand when the Samaritans come and have, offer their help that what the Samaritans offering is a, an approach to worship that does not take seriously the width and depth of God's calling upon them. And that is where I start to feel resonance with us today. Like, I don't know how to take the geopolitics of the ancient Near East and apply it today, but I sure do know what it's like to start grappling with the temptation that the Samaritans offer. It's not... Uh, we, we have this resonance today. We, we are people who, who gather weekly with this same sense of calling that we are, Jesus is calling upon us as wide enough to embrace our entire lives, calling us to entire sanctification. It's deep enough to forgive all of our sins. And, and this is all rooted in us following Jesus. And in doing so, we are, as Paul describes, a, a, a branch grafted onto the tree. We are, there is a Jewish people, God's chosen people, and we are grafted on as the people who have chosen to follow Jesus, accepting this in our baptisms. And so the Samaritans of Ezra's time were tempting the Jewish people to let go of this whip and depth to do something more convenient. And the Jewish people said no. The Samaritans were offering something, something similar, which is why it was so tempting. Something similar, but missing some essential parts. In that case, what the Samaritans were offering was, we'll worship God, but what they weren't saying was, we'll worship only one God. All right? They had the worship of God right, but they were missing that essential part, that they would worship only one God, the only true God. I believe that there are temp temptations that we grapple with today to force, that would involve forsaking the width and the depth of following Jesus. And they are temptations... Uh, that are similar to what the Samaritans offer because they are similar to what we do today, what we are called to do today. They're not the exact same. We live in a, a different time. But, but there's that same nature that something is tempting, not because it is completely strange, but because it is just familiar enough. I'll give you two examples. For example, the temptation I see with regards to the width of our calling to follow Jesus is something I have seen in the churches, something that was pointed out to me by Bishop Peter Story when he, name, he names it the heresy of the half gospel. Right? The width of Jesus' calling to love our neighbors is to love all of our neighbors. And there are some people who hear this, and, and some churches, some people who hear this, and, and respond by calling people to repent and to say, we need to care for their souls. We need to call them to an eternal salvation. We need to call them to for, let go of their sin and, and commit to following Jesus, to pray the, the, the prayer asking for forgiveness and, and to, to turn to follow Jesus, right? And, and, and there are people in churches that believe in doing so. They believe that they're calling has been fulfilled. There are others who hear the calling to love our neighbor as ourselves and respond by pouring themselves out to serve others, to meet their physical needs, to care for jobs and communities and food pantries and to clothe the needy, help with those in poverty, to serve children, and once have done this, believe that their calling has been fulfilled. My friends, what is true is that to love our neighbor is to love all of our neighbor, body and soul. The full width of the gospel is to love all of our neighbor, to be good news for today, that we care about people's stomachs and communities and job prospects, prospects and education and health, and that we care about good news for eternity, that we want to invite others to join us on a journey towards the kingdom of God, following the one who died for us and forgave us and rose to lead us into new life. Right? The temptation to only call for repentance or for only care for people's bodies, that's a, that's a narrowing of the gospel, and the full width of the gospel is to care for people, body and soul, to love all of our neighbor. Another example of the temptation that I see with regards to our calling is what I've heard called moral therapeutic deism. This gets at uh, something that is deep and makes it very shallow. We are called to a deep faith. And mo moral therapeutic deism, it's in the name. Moral, do what is right. Therapeutic, it will feel good. 
deism because there's a God out there. Right? It, I hear people talk about what they believe, and often that's about it. Right? We need to do the right thing because I feel good when I do the right thing. And you know that that is true. It usually does feel good to do what what is right, but but that is just scraping the surface what, of what is true. By itself, it is simply shallow. It is insufficient. You see, we follow a God who loves us so much that he sent his only son to grapple with our deepest struggles, to forgive our worst, to walk through death and come out the other side, to lead us through whatever we will face in this life, our own struggles, our doubts, or our betrayals, whatever they might be, and the end to lead us through our death and lead us towards the kingdom that is to come. And those are going to involve times that sometimes feel good and sometimes do not. Right? But whether it feels good or, or it doesn't feel good, right? We do what is Christ like because it is true. Because the Father created us and leads us in the power of the Holy Spirit towards Christ's kingdom. Right? This is a far deeper thing that we confess. It's not about doing what is right because it feels good, it's about doing what is Christ like because it is true. And there's a real depth there. Sometimes following Jesus doesn't feel good, but it is still what is Christ-like. It is still our calling. I think the temptations that we most often face are the same type of temptations that the Jews face when the Samaritans asked to jump in. They could have accepted it and said, you know what, it's close enough. And instead they said no, and I, I think that was right. right. They said no because they understood that what, what, what they would be inviting in was something that was shallower and, and far more narrow than what a true faith, the faith they were called to, would, would mean. Right? They were, the temptation was to forsake the width and depth of what is true for something that was narrow and shallow, and in the end, insufficient. Ezra reminds us that our life together following Jesus is wide. It is wide and it embraces loving all of our neighbors, body and soul. Ezra reminds us that our life together following Jesus is deep, following him through what might come, whatever will come, knowing that such a wide and a deep faith is what will guide us through this day and each day that is to come until we join with those who have gone before us in the kingdom that is to come. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to bow your heads and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a deep and wide calling, a deep and wide faith. May our faith be deep enough to be true and real and wide enough to cover all, as all aspects of our lives, showing your concern for all parts of us. We pray for this fall as we come upon it, as we come to times, as this transition of the seasons, there's so much that is changing and moving with schools, as holidays loom in, in, the, in not too far off distance. We pray for wisdom and patience in, in these days that are to come. We pray for all those who are uh, sick, all those who are struggling. We pray for all of those uh, churches that are trying to continue to, to, to make these decisions about how to faithfully gather to worship, caring for the souls uh, and, and bodies of, the, of their congregants, as well as uh, making wise decisions for our, our safety and health. We pray for all these things as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you this day and always. Amen.